good afternoon everyone and thank you for coming along for this uh, research translational seminar so today we have four wonderful speakers we are going to be talking about how to uh, help like go into clinical translation from a basic uh, science research projects so before i start introducing them and talk about today's program i would just like to acknowledge the country so we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we are on today the the Turbul and Jagera people, and we recognize their continu continuing connection to land, water, and community. We pay deep respect to them and their cultures and to the elders present and past, past, present, and emerging. So uh, my name is Debutam Sena. I'm actually a postdoc in uh, Professor Ian Fraser's lab. Uh, I would like to thank the TRI Research Translation Committee for giving me this honor to host this uh, seminar today. So today's seminar, uh, we will have four speakers who will be talking uh, about their respective journeys about how do we commercialize our project. And at the end of uh, their talks, uh, we'll open the chair for uh, uh, open discussion wherein we'll uh, invite all the four speakers and then we'll uh, bombard them with questions as, as we have. So uh, today's seminar, the main uh, purpose will be to explore the various pathways to talk on clinical questions and uh, how we can turn it into research projects with translational potential. So to help us with this, we have, first of all, Professor Greg Monteith, uh, who will be sharing his experience on identifying new target drugs uh, that he's been developing against breast cancer and how his work experience been with UQKD to turn this uh, journey of drug development into a commercialization pathway. Uh, followed by this, we will have Professor Jerry Cooper, who will be with us through online, I guess, uh, and we'll be talking with her work on uh, the NDIA project, which is, will be uh, following babies from pregnancy into early childhood to find out what is the cause of type 1 diabetes. So the, after the two research projects, which uh, we will be hearing from uh, Matthew Bertland, uh, who specializes in bringing science into clinical practice. Uh, we will share his thoughts uh, into how science scientists can effectively bridge their laboratory expertise uh, into the clinic by industry and patient engagement. And lastly, we have Tamsin, whom we all know, uh, who will be helping us uh, learn about uh, understanding if a solution to a clinical question actually has what it needs to be translatable. Uh, what do you need to consider if your work is to have any chance at being commercialized by the industry? So we'll have the speakers up for 10 minutes. And uh, uh, when I'm nearing the 10 minutes, I'll like try, I'll try to come up here to just to give you a heads up. But I'm pretty sure you're all expert in keeping it to the time and we'll stick to the time given. So first up, we have Professor Gregory Monteith. He's an associate dean research at the Faculty of Health and Behavioral Science at the University of Queensland. He'll be talking to us about how to find a therapeutic target. So Professor Monty's research group is focused on identifying new drug targets for the uh, treatment of different subtypes of uh, breast cancer, which will have a poor prognosis. Uh, his research group has attracted over 15 million uh, in medical research funding from Australia and US grant agencies. Uh, his work has been focused on uh, discovering calcium signaling in cancer cells, uh, and he has published in renowned journals like Cell Nature Review Cancer, Oncogene, and PNS. Alumni from his research team has been leading uh, research across uh, well-known universities around the globe, and he has senior staff working in pharmaceutical companies and global, uh, global contract research organization servicing um, healthcare industry. So it's glad to have him here. And uh, thank you, Professor. And I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, and thank you for the invitation. So I too would like to acknowledge traditional ownership and the custodians and the lands on which we're meeting today. So I thought I'd um, start by saying that this is very much a personal reflection. So my area of research is calcium and signaling in cancer, so iron channels. So my talk is going to probably be biased towards um, moving projects forwards in those fields. And also, I should say that I'd never really thought about what makes a good therapeutic target when we started to do this kind of research. So it's really a reflection um, looking backwards. 
So we've had two therapeutic targets um, move towards translation. So one was packaged up in a spin-off company called Q Oncology, and the other one, and this will make more sense during my talk, uh, entered the Quedi drug discovery pipeline, which has gone to um, now into the preclinical stage. So I thought in drug discovery, there's this thing called Lipinski's rule of five, which is what makes a drug look like a drug. So I thought I'd frame my talk about five tips or rules on what to consider when you're trying to find a target that might progress the therapeutic drug discovery. And the first thing I'd like to say, particularly for early career research, is to consider your academic career. So there are hundreds of iron channels that we could study, and we'd studied a lot of them. And in retrospect, the iron channels, which probably gave us the most significant grant funding and the most um, prolific and significant papers, are not the same targets that progress towards drug development and business development. Um, so what I'm saying to say there is if you're an elite researcher, I would not put all your baskets in this is a drug target and will be a drug one day. It's good to have a balance and maybe consider still keeping some innovative research on those really high risk areas, which might not be um, as commercial when they first start. I certainly wouldn't start on the, the end of trying to develop a drug. If that was easy, drug companies would do it all the time. So I think you need a, a mix in your research portfolio. The second one, I think I've learned the most during my journey in this, is try and understand the lens that potential partners and investors see things through. So I, my examples there are, let's say I have a target that's overexpressed in cancer and inhibits the proliferation of cancer cells. I now know that potential partners will look that up using public databases. In other words, there are now public databases where you can see the expression of targets in different kinds of cancers. There are CRISPR screens where you can enter the name of a target and see what cell lines it has effects on. In terms of druggability, I might say a target is druggable, but there are now really good databases that someone can type in the name of your gene and get a score about how drug druggable your gene actually is. So keeping in mind that that's what people are going to do. And also they'll ask questions like, is the knockout animal for the target viable? They'll be very interested in what the side effects are of inhibiting your target. So what I'm saying here is, what will they find when they go looking? When they look at you, tell them this is the target you're interested in, and they start looking at those public databases, they start thinking about possible side effects, what will they find? And what concerns will they find? For example, maybe your target isn't defined as being druggable. And what answers will you have for them when they find that information? So I'm saying it's not the end of the world if your target um, leads to a knockout animal, which isn't viable, if you've got a good explanation for that. But be prepared to have those conversations and those considerations. And then one other thing you consider is now, you, you know, we think about those tools and things that investors and companies might be thinking about. Could you, let's say, if you have four or five possible targets define one based on what drug companies would be thinking. In other words, you know, what is the one that's going to have the least systemic side effects when inhibited? Which are the ones that look more druggable using these databases? Which one has the most convincing CRISPR data in these, on these databases as a way to maybe prioritize which ones you focus on? And the third one is keep an eye out for a bus test and screen against your target. So there are whole societies, whole conferences with thousands of people going based on um, laboratory automation and screening to try and um, basically accelerate that drug discovery process. So you really want a robust target relevant assay. So as you're researching your target, keep in the back of your mind what could assay could be used to find the drug against that target. So can your assay be scaled up by a contract research organization to screen hundreds of thousands or millions of compounds? Because that might greatly accelerate a drug discovery program. And these are not general assays. So to get a paper, it might be enough for you to say it stops proliferation of metastases in vivo, but that's not an assay for a drug discovery screen. You think about what assay could you develop to help a drug discovery person find an inhibitor of your target. And that's often something we don't think about when we think about grants, when we think about publications. And so I've underlined there specific to your target. So what, how will you find a drug that inhibits your target when you're working with these drug development organizations? Tip four is to engage with experts in commercialization really early. So 
the, the example I'm going to hear give is Quedi, which is an industry experience team, which consists of medicinal and computational chemists, drug discovery biologists, and Indrix experienced commercial experts. So you can pitch a target to Quedi and they'll do some background work on how druggable your target is and the likelihood of developing a drug. And then they'll give you some advice on what to do. And on top of that, they've also got this esteemed scientific advisory board, which includes people like Dennis Liotta. And Dennis um, discovered the HIV drug, which allowed um, HIV to go down to undetectable levels and also the hepatitis C drugs. So these people are used to basically understanding what a therapeutic target looks like and what things you might do to actually engage industry. And the, the tip five that I have my last one is to be adaptable and engaged. So the vast majority of targets that I've gone to, to a medicinal chemist or to Uniquest or to Quedi have been rejected. So I've got interesting data for a paper, but they say there's no potential here for a drug discovery program. So you need to basically be resilient and used to being rejected because most things we do research in doesn't look attractive in terms of um, developing a, a drug to. Also adaptable, um, as, as was mentioned, my area is breast cancer. Um, but a lot of my programs have gone into other areas like prostate cancer. Now, it's important for me to be adaptable because it takes millions of dollars to do a drug discovery program, takes millions of dollars to do clinical trials. It doesn't really matter what I think. Even if I really do believe these targets are best for breast cancer, it matters really what the people that are going to invest in these programs think. So you need to be adaptable and willing to be flexible in terms of where your research might have to go. And finally, engage. So you're meant to be the expert in this target and have conversations about, you know, what might a good screen be, what relevant experiments might be. So it's important during this process is to try and stay engaged in the conversation with these groups in order to move that research forward. So to summarize, these are my five tips. So consider your academic career, try and understand the lens that potential partners see things through. I think that's probably the one I've learned most. Keep an eye on a robust assay as you're studying your target because that's going to be really important in drug development. Engage with experts in commercialization really early to get advice on where your research is going and be adaptable and engaged during the process. And if I was going to pick one based on the projects I've, I've been involved with, it's this one. Keep an eye on a robust assay. I think most things that haven't progressed in my research group and others is the lack of a really robust assay so that they can go and screen a combatorial library that's got thousands of compounds. For a lot of my targets, I can't give them that. And I realize in hindsight, that's probably why those ones haven't progressed, even though in biology, I'm really excited by those targets. So, and as researchers really early on, we might just see something in passing and you remember that, that I could adapt that to be an assay if it moves towards this process. So with that, I'd like to just do some acknowledgements before I finish up, which is um, the medicinal chemists that we've worked with, um, particularly Ben Ross and Bill Denny, um, the commercialization, um, Uniquest and Quedi, Marie Smith and Dennis Liotta, who've really been inspiring to watch what they've done and to work alongside them, and also members of our research group, both past and present. Thank you very much. We'll have questions from Greg later, and we'll move on to our next speaker. Um, Jennifer is not here. Okay, so we don't have Jennifer online yet because she is joining us from Adelaide. Uh, we'll just, with the interest of time, we'll move on to the next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Sorry, I moved on fast. 
Sorry about that. No, previous one. Ah, okay. Okay. So, sorry about that. Uh, technical faults. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Matthew Bertland. Uh, he's the kind of founder and director of uh, Pharma, PharmaMed Sciences and also the president of Medical Affairs Professional of Australia. Today, he'll be talking to us regarding bridging science, medical, consumer, industry, environment in translating a clinical question. Uh, Matt is, is an experienced medical uh, senior medical manager with long history of working in pharmaceutical industry and clinical roles. He is a skilled pharmaceutical, med pharmaceutical medicine oncology and hematology department. And uh, he has a strong professional background with MMED uh, focused in pharmaceutical medicine from University of uh, Southern Australia. Uh, sorry. UNSW Australia. Uh, Matt now lectures in pharmaceutical medicine in UNSW, and uh, one of Matt's uh, main ambition is to development of medical affair profession and ethical and effective implementation of MSL role. Uh, Matt is secretary of the Australian Medical and Scientific Professional Association, uh, which is a uh, representative of Association of Medical Affairs in Australia and is dedicated to promoting excellence in pharmaceutical medicine through professional development, networking and advocacy. So I'll hand over to Matt. Thanks. I actually didn't know that all them things about me. So that was a really nice introduction. I appreciate it. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you to everybody online. Thank you for the uh, the invite today. So what we're going to talk to about today is how I personally bridge uh, all of this stuff, the science, the medicine, the consumer, the industry, all of that. My more recent role was I was the global medical director at Amgen, and I work across from generally just this side of preclinical to clinical, but really my job is to get things from the bench to the bedside and do it as effectively as I can. So I've been very lucky and fortunate to work with a lot of really good people at TRI and other research institutions. And what I wanted to talk today about is how important it is to have that relationship with uh, industry and, and where that relationship might lie. So I don't know if you know even what medical affairs is, but normally with industry, pharmaceutical companies, most people know about sales and marketing. Medical affairs isn't that. It's part of the research and development arm of, of companies. And actually, it came about probably after, after the war in, the, in 1957, since thalidomide was um, synthesized, where actually companies started to take a lot more accountability for the medicines that they produced. Medical affairs back then was a complete support function. Normally you'd get a doctor who didn't want to be a doctor anymore, drag them into the industry and say, hey, you are our medical affairs department. Now, most companies are moving away from sales and marketing. They're actually putting their money back into research and development. So everybody in medical affairs has scientific medical backgrounds, so either PhD, doctors, whoever, they're a whole smorgasbord. MAPA is a group I put together some years ago because I realized that actually what we needed for this new profession is a professional body, and MAPA is that professional body. So we've got 750 members in Australia. They work for every company in Australia. Um, and our mission basically is to, say, to take these medicines to, to the patients. The reason I wanted to talk today about, about how, you know, how, how, in, how, particularly in translational research, you can tap into places like medical affairs is because of the national medicines policy. So the national medicines policy was, was, you know, conceived 23 years ago. Back then, you know, if you looked at the 10 most prescribed drugs in Australia, they were statins, angiotensin converted enzyme inhibitors, et cetera. Now, if you look at what is being used today, these medicines are incredibly complex. Um, we, we're nowhere near uh, where we need to be with our national medicines policy, but the new iteration, which was just published the other month, actually is a good start. And the reason I wanted to show this is because of the types of stakeholders you need to be considering at every single level and every single avenue uh, in the drug development cycle um, to actually get things to patients, which is what we all want to do. Everybody in this big circle on the right-hand side is important. And these are the people I collaborate with. These are the people I work with pretty much every day. Research and academics is part of the reason I'm here today. I work with the media. I work with the, the, the Commonwealth government, particularly on public-private partnerships, the state governments, 
independent advisory groups and NGOs, the public and private healthcare sectors, healthcare professionals as well. Uh, we, we tended to work generally with clinicians, but we've realized actually clinicians don't know that much about research and they don't know that much about commercialization. And so we really do need to start spanning out and talking to researchers uh, and connecting all of this together. Patients have really lost their patience in all of this. So patients now want to be, want to have a seat at the table. And when it comes to actually bridging the gap, you can't do it without patient and patient advocacy groups, consumer groups. And then the medicines industry is changing as well. So we obviously use a lot of stuff we never use. I use ChatGPT every day. I use ChatGPT every single day. Um, this is here now. We, we Artificial intelligence, like it or not, is here now. And, um, and for my next few slides, my next few slides are going to be quite patronizing to probably everybody in the room. But I suppose it's, it's really about you know, how do we change the model? How do we try and break down the silos between researchers, industry, clinicians? Because there have been silos. There's been this kind of, I mean, I, I can tell you what, when I go to a party and I tell people I work for Big Pharma, people put things in my burgers, right? It's still not a great reputation. But having said that, when I moved to pharma, I realized that some of the best scientists working behind these doors and nothing gets to patients without successful commercialization like it or not. And all this great science that is done every day means nothing unless it gets to patients. The National Medicines Policy is about trying to accelerate that. But the big point of this, the reason I've put this slide up is it's, it's really about collaboration. And the, one, the next few slides I want to leave you with is, is really about how to collaborate. When it comes to whatever you're asking the question of, you need to, def you need to find the gap. You need to define a clinical question clearly before you even start translating into that clinical question. I know that's really easy for me to say when I'm sat here at the other end, and I understand that it, when you sat there in a translational laboratory, actually imagining this and going into a patient is a long way away, but you've got to start getting better at thinking about that, thinking about the patient population you're interested in. The PICOs are, are handy here. But you've got to ensure as well, it's not a fishing exercise. We're not just doing science for curiosity and we're not just doing science for citations, science for impact factors. That's been done before. We, we really need to start collaborating. And uh, uh, I think we just saw in the last presentation how important it is actually to start talking to people who are gonna be thinking about where this fits in the therapeutic landscape. We all know literature review process. I'm not going to talk about this, but you have to check the space. You have to check the gaps. You have to make sure you're not just replicating what somebody else is already doing. And, and if you find somebody that's doing what you're doing, collaborate with them. They probably teach a few things. You could probably teach them a few things. But the point of this is it has to be a gap. Um, and it has to be a gap that's going to still be a gap when your idea or innovation finally gets to patients. That could be seven or eight years away. And again, the medical affairs team, what we're paid to do is basically create this crystal ball almost for organizations to make sure that when these things get through, there's still a clinical need, there's still an unmet need. I said gap a lot, but it's important. We've, we've also got to get a lot better at translating what we do. And I don't mean translational research. I mean, just turning jargon into English. And if you're presenting your ideas, you need to be able to communicate them ideas because it could be government, could be media, could be me, it could be a patient, it could be, there's a various different groups of stakeholders now that you might need to communicate your ideas to, to get people on board and you need to really get good at communicating. Explaining things in high science sounds really cool, but actually if the person that you're communicating to doesn't take that in, it really is academic. And being able to do this in a way that anybody can understand is actually a really difficult thing to do. Now, some of the best scientists I've worked with, some of the best oncologists I've worked with and others, that's their gift, is to be able to take high science, high ideas, and translate it into something that everybody can access. And finally, great science, all the research we do, all the money that goes into great science is literally pointless if it doesn't actually get to patients. Patient access, the HTA, the Health Technology Assessment, the TGA, all of these considerations you need to be thinking about as kind of early as you can. 
the consumer industry is changing, as I've mentioned. Patients are armed with so much information now. And the consumer industry environment, particularly in Australia, isn't an easy one. And so really, if you are able to work with the medical affairs departments, and again, medical affairs now is spanning into biotech, because biotech's replacing industry. Biotech's the, the biotech's the, the where you know where a where a scientist and an investor can bust. Biotech where it's at. And, and, and acquisitions are going to be probably the future of the industry. But medical affairs is moving into biotech. Uh, medical affairs is moving into contract research organizations as well, CROs. So get to understand medical affairs a little bit. Um, a lot of people actually want a career in medical affairs. I can help with that too. But I suppose that's my final point is just try and figure out who you need to collaborate with um, and do it. You're never going to be able to do this on your own. So I think... That's right on 10 minutes. Oh, no, I have 30 more seconds. It's quite impressive. Thank you for your time. Okay, so next speaker, we have Dr. Tamsin Terry. Uh, she's going to talk to us about what do you need to consider to ensure there is a commercial pathway. So Dr. Thompson is uh, currently the Director of Commercialization Life Sciences Uniquest. She has been with uh, Uniquest since 2018 and working with the researchers here at UQ to commercialize their cutting edge technology, either by licensing deals or startups and to create their impact. Uh, Thompson has extensive experience in industry and academia, and uh, prior to joining uh, Uniquest, she has been um, uh, the Director for Research and Development with the Wound Manager in Innovation CRC, and she has been having multiple roles with uh, uh, companies like GeneTrack, Private Limited, and Akambase, as well as uh, UQ. So I present Thompson. Thank you. So what do you need to consider to ensure there is a commercial pathway? Um, this is not actually an easy question because if we consider what we... Sorry. If we consider what we... If you consider all the technologies we commercialize out of TRI, there are a huge range of projects that have come through our doors recently, from clinical data, clinical samples, therapeutic targets, vaccines, drugs, formulations, medical devices, diagnostics, manufacturing processes, and even care pathways are all research outputs that can be commercialized. And with each one, there are different challenges among the commercial pathways, but there are some really unifying considerations. When we look at a new technology, the first thing we always ask ourselves is, how is this gonna change clinical care or current practice? If it's not gonna change clinical care, who and why will somebody pay for it? They won't if it's not changing something. What is the current solution out there and competitors? There is a fallacy that patients are dying on the streets with no care. Every patient a doctor is trying to treat. They may not have effective tools, but they are trying to treat. And in many cases, they might not be using current treatments for some reason, and there are barriers there. So understanding that is important. And then finally, we look at if there is a unique IP position. Unfortunately, as Matt pointed out, uh, very, very few drugs get through to the FDA without being backed by a pharma company. I know of three, River Blindness, TB, and I can't remember what the third was, that were taken through by charities. The amount of data you need to collect is just not feasible without a commercial plan, um, and therefore you need an IP position. doesn't matter how hand on heart you want to help patients, you need the IP position to get through. So when you're thinking about early stage research, um, it's really easy to come up with ideas. But the real question that I think differentiates people who are really good at identifying commercially tractable projects 
and those who are really good at getting publications, um, and hopefully sometimes it's the same group, is being able to answer the question, should this project be done? There are many ways you can spend your time um, choosing projects where you are going to get a potential to translate, particularly in this building, the Translational Research Institute, um, is key. And similarly to what uh, Matt explained, we really need to understand the clinical problem being solved. In whom? Which patient subjects? Is it prevention? Is it treatment? Then we look at what's already in clinical trial because we need to look at 2030 at the moment. What is the drug landscape going to be like in 2030? Is there going to be potentially space for this new idea to fit in that landscape? What's happening elsewhere? Um, there may be similar projects happening in Europe. Uh, just because we're doing it on Australia doesn't make it novel and commercial. What are the companies doing other than not publishing? Companies basically only publish either to keep their scientists sweet on projects that they've discontinued or for a sound commercial reason. Uh, all their good stuff is kept under wraps um, until the last possible minute. Minute. So you need to try and find out what they're presenting at conferences, what they're patenting, and understand how that fits with your project. And finally, likely payer interest. Who is going to pay? Why are they going to pay? There's only a finite amount of money to go on medical care. How are they going to pay for your item and not somebody else's? Moving on, you need to look at unmet need. What is the current standard of pair? care? What new technologies have come into the field that nobody's using and why aren't they being used? And what's the unmet need really? If you go to a clinician and say, hey, I've got this great new idea, um, they'll probably being interested scientific minded people say, oh, that's really interesting. But go to a clinician, clinician and reframe the question. I've got this great new idea. Which of your patients would you use it in? You might get very different responses. So really thinking about how you question patients, carers, um, clinicians, and people working in health policy around your idea and getting not just enthusiastic answers, but meaningful um, data will help you measure whether your project should be done. The final one on unmet need is how will your tech fit into the clinical care pathway? Uh, we had a technology a few years ago. It was a diagnostic in the wound care space. Uh, it was really great. It was cool. It diagnosed stuff really well. It took an hour. And the researcher was convinced that that was, it was going to be a quick result. We went to a bunch of nurse practitioners and they threw their hands up in horror. They said, we can't have patients sitting around for an hour. Have you seen how our clinics run? Half the people have got dementia. We're going to have to double our staff to run this diagnostic test. So really understanding whether your Technology is going to fit into clinical care um, pathways is important. There is a pharma company in Australia who's just put on eight people, one per state, to look at how they bring in new medicines into hospital settings. Um, and their job is not promoting any drugs, just trying to help hospitals work out how to use therapies like CAR T. Um, and they've decided that's a good place to put marketing money because they need to build capacity in the system. Moving on to translation, is the technology feasible? The best technologies don't get through, the most feasible test technologies do. Is it manufacturable, scalable? Is it price competitive? And is the pathway to translation feasible? Uh, Greg talked about having a, an, an assay. When you get beyond that, do you have an animal model you can test things in? Um, is the, the target relevant in the disease? The best of use of your time if you've got a new target is go and find out if there are any human double mutants and what their pathology is, because that will give you a read about your target in your target species. Um, and then moving on to clinical trials, it's really easy to do a phase one study and destroy a program. You need to be able to get early biomarkers demonstrating that your um, target is uh, relevant in the in that clinical trial and your th therapy is actually engaging with it if you do a phase one and you can't get a read as to whether your molecule is working or not it's really really hard to move further on um, and then is the uptake route feasible 
can you align with clinical practice? And are you going to take, and this is really harsh, um, are you going to take a funding stream away from medical practitioners or are they going to get a new funding stream? Um, it's quite difficult to market new technologies which destroy somebody's life, livelihood. So those are some general principles about how to position your uh, project. Um, moving on, um, there's a couple of things really to consider early on. First of all, IP and ownership. Um, these are sort of the, really the roots on which you need to build your project and make sure I know most researchers are like, oh, don't do paperwork. Don't tell me about that, Tamsin. I don't want to know. Um, it just gets in the way. The challenge is if you're not on top of who owns your IP, first of all, the new project IP, you may block your amazing results from ever being commercialized. You may also find out that somebody else actually owns your IP that you've just uh, worked on. We've had a couple of cases um, when we've asked somebody, oh, where did you get that tool compound from? Oh, I got it from a pharma company. Can I see the MTA? We own everything and also your children. Thank you very much. Um, same com compound um, is available commercially. No children owned. You could do it for free and they've just picked the wrong molecule. Query brands here from Query um, are really helpful and can, can let you know, can look for things for us. So if you're wanting a compound, you know, happy to try and help source it commercially. Um, obviously, you'll need to pay, but it may be much better paying $700 to have freedom. It's not a lot to pay. Background IP, who owns it? Can you actually use it? Is it yours? At what cost? Um, does the, the use of somebody's background IP mean somebody already owns the project IP? Have you already given that away in an agreement that you shoved in the drawer five years ago? Um, and then finally, when you've got your research team together, are they going to play nice? Because at some point, if we're going to move this forward, we're going to need everybody to cooperate. Um, will the funders interfere? Some of the charities are trying to insert themselves in the commercialization process, which on one level is really, um, you know, I understand where they're coming from, but oops, that's telling me to shut up. <laughs> A pharma company is not going to negotiate with more than one entity. So we need to gather everybody together and have one entity. Clinical consents is a, I'm going for one more minute, is a, um, another area. We like really explicit consent within um, any PICFs that the patient knows that there's a chance of commercialization. Research team could make out like bandits. Institute could make out like bandits patient is not going to get any benefit. We have language around that. If it's in the PICF, then you can do a lot more with samples than if you can't. The final way to um, sacrifice your potential commercial success is to disclose your IP um, early. Within TRI, we do now have the pan-TRI CDA. Um, that's good, but I would not be disclosing anything that's super commercial under that CDA and a TRI seminar. It's just not going to hold up. Um, you can't prove that everybody agreed to it. So it's good for having general discussions and presenting general data, but I'm pretty sure that Greg wouldn't come to a TRI sem seminar and use that to present his query data. So if you are wanting to get more information around um, research positioning, commercialization pathways, please come and talk to one of the TRI tech transfer people. Myself and Anthony Raphael are based here. Uh, periodically, Andrew Leach represents QT and Erica White, um, PAH. Um, and finally, for those uh, UniQuest um, clients, uh, that's Fraser Institute and MARTA. We actually have a research commercialization workshop on the 8th and 9th of May, um, which is a great opportunity to find out more about commercialization and actually workshop projects with our team. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. So we have our last speaker, Professor Jennifer Cooper. Jennifer, can you hear me online? Yep, I can. Thank you. 
Okay, so Professor Cooper is joining us from Adelaide. Today she'll be uh, talking about uh, designing a cohort study to find biomarkers and connect with research. Okay. Uh, Professor Cooper is an active clinician as a pediatric endocrinologist and is currently the head of discipline of pediatrics, uh, Adelaide Medical School, Faculty of Health and Medical Sciences, University of Adelaide. Uh, she's been running and leading uh, uh, a diabetes uh, a study called the NDA study, which mainly investigates uh, the first study, which investigates on the prenatal to early origin of childhood type 1 diabetes and has refined early biomarkers and strategies to reduce cardiovascular diseases. She's currently a member of Advisory Council of International Society of Pediatric and Adolescent Diabetes, uh, which is called SPAD, and a co author of national and international guidelines for the management of type 1 diabetes. So we'll lead on to uh, her talk. Uh, uh, Professor Jennifer, do you mind switching on the camera of yours so that we can see mm. you? Yeah, I will. I'll just... Um... Is it better now? Can yeah. you see that okay? Yeah, we can see you. I can um, quite, can't quite, I'll just see if I can, yeah, is that, yeah, I think we're right now. Is that okay? Yeah, I'll yep. great. great, off we go. Uh, first, thanks very much for inviting me um, to what sounds like a really interesting symposium. So I'm just using um, this cohort, obviously we've got to the end somehow, um, right, let's go. Just using this cohort, which I've introduced, um, the India cohort, as a bit of an example, I think, of setting up a cohort, um, what seemed to be important and what worked well, um, what we would do differently. And just a little bit of background, this is a cohort looking at the development of the very first stages of type 1 diabetes in young children going back to pregnancy. And it, it combines genetic risk within the immune activation, the immune response, getting through to what we call stage 1 type 1 diabetes, uh, where the uh, first um, signs of the island antibodies, multiple antibodies are developed. And I guess what was critical to this cohort, and the reason I think, in fact, why we've had funding, um, particularly internationally, is that this first stage of type 1 diabetes begins very early in life. And prior to us setting up this cohort, um, there were no studies going right back to pregnancy to look at the origins of type 1 diabetes. So these types of figures showing the first antibodies appearing early can also be seen in Australian children. So we set off to follow um, Australian children who were at risk of type 1 diabetes because they had a first degree relative of type 1 diabetes from the pregnancy, uh, proposing that sort of multiple environmental factors in early life were interacting via biological systems, particularly the omic systems, to increase the penetrance of the risk genes and leading to those first stages of type 1 diabetes. Um, it's obviously not like going out to get any cohort uh, of a normal population, or there are quite a lot of pregnancy cohorts in Australia, but they're really all in the sort of normal population. But we obviously had to find um, the pregnant mother who had type 1 diabetes or her partner and the, fa the baby's father had type 1 diabetes or the sibling at home. So for that reason, it's why the network across a lot of sites um, and that has made it more complex. And the uh, protocol probably makes some small changes, but it's been reasonably successful in terms of its frequent sampling uh, of VAR samples, uh, some of which are quite original and also um, supported by fairly comprehensive questionnaires, which we certainly haven't regretted, even though at the time it seemed moderately burdensome for the families. And all in all, with a 50% participation rate, which is probably, as you'd expect, for a reasonably onerous observational study for some time, and with some um, casualties during the pregnancy and dropouts down to our population, and uh, I guess it's to really make the point that you always need more than you have. We had pressure on us to reduce the size of this cohort. And thank goodness we didn't have to succumb to that pressure. 
So it's set up really to look at the early life determinants of type 1 diabetes and indeed celiac disease, but I won't mention that today. Uh, but in fact, you know, as, as we sort of got into the study, it became apparent that we had some opportunities in other areas, which I'll come to, which I think is an interesting way when you start with cohorts and things develop over time. And another thing that changed over time was originally we had to predict how many children would develop the primary outcome, which was persistent islet autoimmunity or so-called stage one, well, in the case of multiple stage one diabetes, in the case of single, just persistent islet autoimmunity. And this has changed um, during the course of the study. The, on the left, you can see the total rate of conversion to antibodies, which is much higher than anticipated. And this is because of another antibody we were measuring, which hadn't been measured prospectively before and was at a higher instance than we had anticipated. But interestingly, the so-called stage one diabetes, the multiple antibody seroconversion rate didn't really change um, from what we predicted over the course of the study. This is obviously very important though for the planning of how we're going to analyze um, the uh, cohort and the data. We also started off, and, and um, Emma Hamilton Williams, who's in the audience, is very much part of the study in a nested case control study. And there was quite a lot of criticism of this and quite a lot of discussion about whether we should or should not do it. Uh, and interesting things like, you know, we had started off with the outcome being IELTS autoimmunity that was persistent after we started the India. It was um, a meta-analysis was done which showed that there was quite a substantial difference in the risk of single persistent versus multiple persistent IOT antibodies. And we were therefore a little concerned about this outcome measure, but it became apparent that we actually have such young children that the meaning of single is a little bit different than it normally is, and that most of them, a lot of them are progressing to multiple. So there's always some interesting caveats on your original design, which you think is watertight, which as knowledge advances can be further questions. So we're leading towards a more definitive case cohort study around probably 2024 to 2025. So this is the NISTA case control study, which is, as Emma knows, took an awfully lot of time to develop. There were sort of three iterations of it. And actually Emma was very helpful, I think, in this design and, 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 and working out the timing. Um, and it's, it's looking particularly at the ohm samples with the um, cost of doing those in very large groups. And I think, I think we'll be, I think we'll decide we've made the right decision to do this interim analysis, but it was certainly a big decision to do it. The other area which we hadn't actually realized quite how well we were set up to look at was the impact of maternal type 1 diabetes during pregnancy. It's obviously quite a lot easier to find a mum with type 1 diabetes who's pregnant than to find a dad with type 1 diabetes, whose partner's um, uh, pregnant, <laughs> as it were. But um, this was an opportunity for us to look at this and also the phenomenon of maternal protection, because about 60% of the mothers in India have type 1 diabetes themselves, and the other 40%, either the dad or the child at home has type 1 diabetes. So this is interesting phenomenon of maternal protection, and India is quite well to set up to answer this question. Uh, because of the way the study was designed, in a sense, for another reason. So it's interesting how these things become apparent as the study goes on. And there's been quite a lot of international interest in some of these samples. Then we've also been able to even go into clinical areas and look at um, mental health, comparing them. Um, and we had some very reassuring results from the mental health the system for looking after women with type 1 diabetes in Australia is quite intensive and quite standardised. And in fact, mental health was, to our surprise, very robust in the woman with type 1 diabetes and comparable to those without. And we had some other clinical studies like this as well. Then the children actually progressing to type 1 diabetes, we found opportunities we hadn't envisaged when we set off to design this cohort we can look at. Quite a few of us are pediatric endocrinologists. And I also mentioned this, this particular area because um, uh, your colleagues at the Queen, Queensland Children's Hospital um, Tony Wing and Mark Harris have been very active in this area as well of continuous glucose monitoring in children progressing to type 1 diabetes and the sort of fascinating stage where children's blood glucose levels are more variable. They haven't got type 1 diabetes clinically. They don't need insulin yet. But they're showing this variability asymptomatically some months to even longer before they actually get clinical type 1 diabetes. And Avani Hain runs this um, study from Western Australia. And then we've had some work that we're doing locally here in South Australia in relation to exocrine function. Um, we talk mainly about endocrine function and type 1 diabetes, but we do know that the pancreas is smaller in young children 
um, with type 1 diabetes. This is some ultrasound images we have from our clinics here. And this interesting idea that exocrine pancreas, the asthma cells, are also involved. And we did show in a small group of progressors that uh, children progressing to type 1 diabetes or assistant multiple art antibodies uh, do have um, lower orbit in the normal range exocrine function markers, which we're expand to larger numbers. So lessons learned, I think, is probably the most important slide here. And first, that original question was just so critical uh, to us being able to get the very large amounts of money required to run these very expensive cohorts. We're talking about 40 million um, and probably about, I guess, some of that was some of the associated science, but probably close to uh, 25 million for the infrastructure of India, which is an enormous amount of money. And without that going back to pregnancy, we wouldn't have, I don't think, got anything like that funding because there were other international birth cohorts going from the first year of life. The other thing I think I learned, um, having not really had much experience with running very large cohorts like this across many centres, was it was really important to get governance and ownership really shared across the states. We've got a lot of talent in Australia and a you know, quite diverse talent. And it just seemed really important early on to make sure that different states had ownership of their research programs within India. We vigorously searched also for fathers with type 1 diabetes who confer a higher risk to the child. Um, and that was quite a lot of effort to do that because it was obviously much easier to find the pregnant mother with type 1 diabetes. But I'm glad we did that because it's paid off, I think, for some of those questions about maternal protection. And we've also been fortunate, I think, because we've had international funding to open up opportunities, particularly at the present time, to get some money from them to fund external collaborators to ND, which really opens up our horizons and our expertise um, breadth. Some of the things that we perhaps haven't done as we would do again, um, we started before full funding. You get excited about your first NHMRC $1 million grant and off you go. And it wasn't adequate in a sense to do it properly. We therefore, I think, um, appointed research assistants a bit late in each state. Um, for a while, the nursing coordinators were doing some of the laboratory work, which wasn't good use of their time. We underestimated the task of data collection entry and the nightmare of things like free text and going back over it. Subsequently, we've spent about 18 months going through all the pregnancy unit records again for the whole country, which has been an enormous job, but we're virtually there. And we did have these pressures um, to recruit um, less to save money and recruit more quickly and brought in some babies postnatally, which I do now regret. And I think that's just one of the issues you have um, with the pressures of recruitment and funding and milestones versus the best possible science and contribution you can make from your cohort. So with um, obviously very grateful to our funders, to our great team of around the um, country researchers and to our wonderful families. Thank you very much. Okay, that brings us to the end of the discussion. Thank you to all the speakers. So now we'll have Jennifer online and also we'd like to invite all the speakers to the panel and we'll open the floor for any type of questions from the audience. Any questions? Yes, Paul. Perhaps I could start with this sort of controversial question then. So, you know, you've highlighted um, in much of the discussion about many of the challenges that come up if you're trying to translate your work. So the question, question I was asking is, why do we do this in an academic setting at all? Isn't this for pharmaceutical companies or medical device companies? Why should we do this in, in, a, in a university? I can take that because our researchers are brilliant and the probability of pharma companies, some, in some areas, you know, yes, they've got amazingly large teams, but it's that, um, immediate and um, deep insight that you sometimes get in academia 
that can give us a competitive edge. And I would say we all, we tell government it's important to invest in basic research when we put in grants and stuff. And so I think, and part of it is like the economic benefit. So I think ethically, and it's very rarely happens that if you do see a target which can progress, I think we're sort of morally obligated to at least attempt to move that forward because we're telling governments that we should always invest in basic research because it's, it's the development pathway. So if we give up our IP, and then that can't progress to the clinic, it's really waste and investment in some basic biology. So if government, and I think this is happening a little bit in Singapore and ASTAR and things that the government is saying, well, what do we get out of this investment now? And I think we've, we've been investing enough in this area to say, okay, what are government getting for it? And if we can point to people like Ian Fraser and people in this room that have progressed to really advanced stages, then they can say yeah, it clearly is worth investing in, in these programs. But I don't think we, we, we should all do it because really finding a target that meets my criteria and then Tamsin's criteria, there's not going to be many. But when we find it, I think maybe we should move it forward. Sort of come back on that. So, so I suppose my question is, how are we better at doing this than a pharmaceutical company? Well, we're not, but with the target bit, I think we're good at. I'm not. That's why I went to UniQuest and Quetty very early. It's not my response. I don't develop drugs. I mean, so I just basically say this might be an interesting target. Almost always UniQuest and Quetty say no. Kaysley say yes. And then I just, I'm just involved in it. But I do not develop the drug. I mean, your question is right. If we look at all the medicinal chemists across Australia, are they all developing drugs? Probably not. And, and that's a different question. But we as people identify targets. I think that's our role to pass those targets on early so they can be considered. Uh, I mean, but I'm, I'm not really yeah. for developing a drug, I agree. And then I'm guessing, I don't know if you want to comment, Quetty doesn't feel like you'll have to. Um, so uh, Big Pharma are very risk averse. They won't take on a project unless they really de-risk it and they're fairly sure about the, the link to human disease. So where Quetty fits in, and Quetty is under Uniquest and I've worked with Tamsin. Uh, so a project like Greg's would come into query, we'd assess it with uh, a much more open mind. We would take on that risk, which farm, big pharma wouldn't take on in order to get, for example, a first in class drug or fill a niche somewhere that maybe big pharma are not willing to look at, maybe get it into the brain, whatever the niche might be, and take on that risk and then de-risk it and then sell it back to pharma, provide all the evidence in a robust package a very focused group. So our objectives are to provide that robustness in the science, that convincing de-risking. So pharma will then look at it and say, yep, I see what you've done there. We're keen and interested in that. If they're not, then we may take it further actually into the clinic. That's being looked at now because we now have some more advanced projects, further de-risking it, further making it relevant to the patient. So obviously ticking many of the boxes that were shared today at the same time, but in a perhaps a more open-minded way than, than the very rigorous assessment that pharma would put on these projects. Yeah, and I don't, I don't think pharma is worse than academia. I don't think academia is better. I think if you look at some of the major medicines and some have come all the way through biotech to pharma companies, not academia. I think we need to completely break these silos down. I don't think the term big pharma is very useful. I think it's something that people sort of scorn upon, but unfortunately, you know, if it wasn't for big pharma, none of these medicines would get to patients, right? So I think we just have to accept the fact we, we need to work together um, and, and collaborate. And it's not, there is a bit of a them and us kind of thing going on uh, still today. And I think we need to challenge that. Yes, Mahesh. Thank you. We, we've heard about how uh, about risk, but I think the risk for researchers is they'll get caught up by governance and contracts and they won't be able to publish under the current model. So I'd particularly like to hear from Matt about how other countries manage to de-risk that aspect that prevents researchers from working with farmers. 
Yeah, Australia is not very good. <laughs> That's it. Um, you know, we, we've got we've got a lot of problems with 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 governance right now. Here, we've got a lot of problems actually as a country getting medicine through our health health technology assessment. And so, you know, a, a lot of big companies don't want to invest in Australia to make these things streamlined because it's actually not a very attractive place to as a first launch country largely because of our health technology assessment on average 820 days between regulatory approval and, um, and reimbursement, probably the slowest in the world. Um, I've not got the answer, I'm afraid, but I think it's, you know, we do, we need to look at other countries, Canada and other countries like that, that similar models that um, do it slightly better. I'm afraid I've not got the answer, but I can certainly appreciate where you're coming from with the question. Um, just coming back to Paul's question, I've worked with multiple pharmaceutical companies as a as an academic partner, and I think partnership is really the, the the bottom line. So they do some things well, we do some things well. We have freedom to be able to put a lot of in depth thought and and research and blue sky um, thinking, and to come up with innov innovative ideas and and potentially targets. They have. Um, the same kinds of constraints as we do on the projects they take up. So they have to still apply to their upper management to be able to do certain projects. They can't just, you know, <laughs> they just get a pot of money and then they can just do what they want. So I think it's about finding fit where, you know, we're helping to de-risk what, um, what they would otherwise have to do to, to sift through the information that we give them. If we provide a, a really you know, good case, and, and then they investigate that and decide to partner, then they, we continue to take that risk, but they provide um, extra resource into what we can do so that we can together de-risk it further. So I think the partnership is really what it's all about. Yeah, certainly with the Quedi project, we would be looking to get feedback from pharma, biotech, clinicians, the whole schema that was described by uh, Matt and others, and that feedback then goes into our project to make the project a better project for patients and for commercialization. And just, just to come back to my point, I mean, I, it wasn't that I disagreed with it. I mean, I agree with everything everybody said, and I think it's just worth us thinking about those different roles that we have. So we are not the same as a pharmaceutical business or whatever, mm. but but I can see that we can really bring things that they don't have and exactly what you said, Ranjan. It's it's understanding that difference between between our imperatives, but where we can benefit mutually in, in that experience. That's really important. Just going back to my original comment, our researchers are brilliant. It's that strength and quality of science that we can bring to bear on a project that is the reason why we have a seat at the table. If we say every lab needs to become a query, but without the query, techno you know chemists and all the rest of it that's not what we're talking about here it's where there is something that's born out of the academic strength and the rigor that's applied around there that gives us you know we have the world's expert in a number of areas here um, and that's what we need to build on yeah, thank you very much for, for your presentations. Um, I liked uh, Greg's first point uh, where we have to consider our career to see if we do, if you find a drug or if you do something else. And so one of the realistic scenarios in, um, in basic science or in, um, in science in general is that you work in your favorite molecule and um, the, uh, identify a pathway, but then the, the potential druggable target is not the, your favorite molecule, but something downstream in the pathway. So the, the real question here is now, um, and that's also alluding to Matt, who said uh, it's not a race about the high impact paper or uh, the high citations. In the end, it's actually a little bit of all of the above. And um, so the, I think the real challenge for us is to identify the right time point in your research uh, where you start to commercialize. So just a targeting, uh, uh, studying the molecule, you want to publish that, you want to present it at conferences, obviously you don't want to reveal your, your IP. But on the other hand, is that already enough for revealing the IP, or, or at which point do I need to shut up and um, and um, uh, yeah, and um, not reveal my work? And I think that's a high. I point. ask Uniquest very early on if I think something's interesting, and there is one example where we probably gave up a high-profile paper because we held back. But usually, it's you know 
it's that they're more interested in the IPs and the molecule or the targeting, not the target. So I've only seen one example where my publication has been delayed and UniQuest said, look, this is a really novel target, hold off a little bit and we'll do some. And they also suggest sometimes to do really weird experiments like, like use a really non-selective agent in order to get proof of principle, which I've got a surprise for. Like, I know this agent is really non-specific. Why would you do that? But that's why you need to engage with them early because they suggest those experiments for you to tease out what you need to do. And generally, I think it's, I've only seen it delay something by a year. But, you know, and that's a compromise. They might tell you, oh, look, yeah, you need to get a high profile paper. They're really, you know, this is, you don't need to hold off. You can move forward. I'd say that's why you engage with them early to get that advice. Or they say, no, that target's already known because they'll look, do a background check and say, someone else has actually put a provisional patent on that. So go ahead and publish. And, but maybe we could develop an assay or something and start a drug discovery program. Yeah, and what, what um, we're really keen to do as well is, is understand the the capabilities, I suppose, to my his point of like of um, of Australia, particularly um, for things things like organoids, right? So we're we're really keen to start testing things earlier with organoids, marry it with artificial intelligence, and sort of understand where all that amazing tech is. I love the science that comes out of Australia, but again, it doesn't get to the ears of the people, you know, that actually make these decisions and. Um, again, the medical affairs teams are kind of there to try and help get that message up. But you're, you're absolutely right with the IP thing as well. You don't want to start talking too early because people steal your ideas, frankly, right? And so you need to make sure your IP is protected and make sure you, you, you don't just let it all out because we've all seen that happen and it gets taken by somebody else. So, yeah, yeah. this is where query is like a sort of safe space come and get advice within UniQuest because we're all within the same UQ family. And if you come and talk to us early about your work, we might say, yep, that could be interesting. Let's keep tabs on it. Or it may be, yes, we want to start on something now and we can make an arrangement with you. And as Greg says, it only delays publication a little bit. All we want to do is make sure we get our IP properly done before we publish anything that could be damaging to that IP. So it's just to get the IP first, then the publication after. And we also have another example, finally, of a paper that we're publishing to try and accelerate commercialization. So essentially that, that publication will help us commercialize, but you just have to do all the different things in the correct order and we can help with a discussion. So happy to discuss with anyone at any time, talk to Tamsin, uh, we can arrange a, a chat with uh, people from Query, myself or some of our team. I'd just like to comment that Come and get our view. Don't try and work out what our view is. There mm. seems to be a great fear if I go to talk to UniQuest, I won't be able to publish my paper. Actually come and talk to us because most of the time, um, you know, we'll say, well, on balance, let's go forward. If it's a really hot target, then, you know, it's gone into query, then it's a different discu discussion. But we're not in the business of sitting um, and sort of trying to cancel academic careers. We don't always get it right. There are papers that I've let go that I wish I hadn't, but the circumstances were that we we didn't have the resources to take the, take that forward, and so we made a decision that yep, that's a really novel target, but we got to get it out there because we we don't have the resource to develop it. So you know it, it's really about partnership ar around this and trying to. We are in the Translational Research Institute. Anybody who works here should be thinking about how do I use my incredible science to help patients. And that unfortunately is through commercialization or fortunately, depending which way you look at it. <laughs> but you know, that's really the only way that um, things around new targets are gonna get into new drugs. Um, you know, potentially you can get practice changes through without a IP or commercial, um, particularly in a local context. But if you're looking at sort of um, global impact from your research, which will last many years after you've perhaps given up with pets. Um, it really needs to be commercialization. Okay, with respect to time, we'd like to conclude the session. There's no questions online. So thank you everyone. Thank you, Pam, for being here. And it was wonderful to hear your views on the this topic. And we'd like to thank you again.